Welcome to Theology in Perspective, the Bible teaching ministry of Dr. Daniel Woodhead. This program is dedicated to bringing you relevant insight into the biblical text that pertains to our time. Here is Dr. Woodhead with today's Bible teaching. The first of the visions I'm going to talk about today, and it's the horses, the four horses. And uh, the text starts out here in Zechariah chapter 1, verses 7, and I'm going to read all the way through to 15 to get you the flavor of this prophecy, and then we're going to go back and look at it in a uh, verse-by-verse basis. This is titled, The Red Horse Rider Among the Myrtle Trees. Upon the four and twentieth day of the eleventh month, which is the month Shebat, in the second year of Darius, came the word of Jehovah unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edu. Ah, I guess I didn't put that down there. The son of Edu. I saw by night, and behold, a man riding on a red horse, and he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom, and behind him were their red horses speckled and white. Then said I, O my Lord, what are these? And the angel that talked with me said unto me, I will show thee what these be. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are they whom the Lord hath sent to walk to and fro through the earth. And they answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro through the earth, and behold, all the earth sitteth still and is at rest. And the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah, against which thou hast had indignation these threescore and ten years? And the Lord answered the angel and talked with me with good words and comfortable words. So the angel that continued with me said unto me, Cry thou, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy, and I am very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease, for I was but a little displeased, and they helped forward the affliction." Therefore, thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it, saith the Lord of hosts, and a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. Cry yet, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, My cities through prosperity shall be spread abroad, and the Lord shall yet comfort Zion and shall yet choose Jerusalem. Now, this prophecy starts off in in just a normal fashion of most prophecies in the Old Testament with a date and a place, and, uh, but here, there's more supporting information even than what was given at the very beginning of this book that we looked at a few weeks ago. We see here that um, this is talking about a very specific day, the 24th day of the 11th month. Now, in the Hebrew calendar, this is the month Shabbat. And that particular day during their captivity was February the 15th, 519 B.C. And uh, that would be reckoning in our contemporary calendar because they measured things a lot differently back then. That's three months after the initial call of Zechariah, that we saw in chapter 1, verse 1, who's the, whose father was Berechiah and whose grandfather was Edo. But there's some significance to this particular day here because five months earlier, the spirit of Zerubbabel and of Joshua, um, through the preaching of Haggai, caused people to go back and start rebuilding the temple. So it's exactly five months since the beginning of the reconstruction of the temple there that had been destroyed, had been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king. Now, some English versions will not translate all of this information on this verse because they say it's repetitious and it wouldn't be good English, so they don't put that in. So it doesn't have some of this data. The word-for-word translations will, will have it in. 
Now, this is the first prophecy of eight particular visions that Zechariah is going to get in the same night. Now, remember, Zechariah's name means the Lord remembers. Um, now, these eight visions are going to be followed up at the end of them, and it's going to take us about ten weeks to get through these visions. The last segment of this in chapter 6 is the crowning of the new high priest, a guy named Joshua, different Joshua than the one that came in uh, after Moses to the promised land, General Joshua. These visions represent God's program during the times of the Gentiles. Now, we've looked at the times of the Gentiles, and the ladies just went through the book of Daniel knowing what the times of the Gentiles are and how they are laid out in the book of Daniel. But the book of Daniel teaches what the Gentile nations are doing, and God has allowed them to do. The book of Zechariah teaches us what God is doing and going to do, yet future to us still, some of these prophecies during the times of the Gentiles. So that's the big distinction between the two. I've said before that Daniel is like book one of the prophecies of the times of the Gentiles. Zechariah is like book two, the second half of the story. First half is, well, this is what the Gentiles are doing and are going to do, and this is what God is doing. According to the Various interpretations of these visions, I have to tell you, there's incredible unity amongst all the commentators because visions and imagery, prophetic imagery, have a consistency throughout the Bible. And amongst the conservative commentators, there's much unity about the meaning of these visions. Even the Jews who deny the, the rabbis that are not Christians, that deny uh, the Lord Jesus as being the Christ or the Messiah, even they have unity about these visions. They struggle with the visions of Christ, but it's just amazing to see how much congruence there is, or unity, if you will, about what these visions mean. What we can get out of this is that there is great comfort in knowing that no matter what happens in the world, in any government, in anywhere on this earth, God is in control. God is controlling things. We may not like the things that are happening here because of the sin that's in the world, but he manages that sin. He only lets it go so far, and then he stops it. The text here tells us that there was a vision that came to Zechariah. And this is the way God will give a vision, give some communication to his prophets. He does so by the way of a vision. This is not a nightmare. This is not some flighty dream. The prophet was completely conscious, alert, knew it was taking place. This is how God speaks. You know, God is spirit. God is not going to come to us with audible sounds, sound waves, concussions in the air that hit our eardrums. He's spirit, and he will speak to his servants in a spiritual way. He will give them that information. The, uh, the text here, the word of Jehovah is Devar Yehovah, the word of the Lord, the word of Jehovah. The pictures that are given here are given in a spiritual communication to Zechariah. These were impressed upon his will. He's conscious. It's not like he wakes up and <clears throat> he's got this dream. This is the actual communication. God lives outside of time and space. God will not communicate to us as men do and women do amongst each other. That is for the things that happen here on this earth. He speaks to our spirits. The prophets, once they receive the prophecies, are then instructed to communicate that to the people in the way that normal humans communicate. So God spiritually communicates to his chosen people, the prophets, 
of which there aren't any more, by the way, because the canon is complete, the Bible is complete, so we don't have any more prophets. But then we have writings, and we have what they have said. Look, look at the text here in Amos 3, verses 7 to 9a, where the Bible says, Surely the Lord Jehovah will do nothing except he reveal his secret unto his servants, the prophets. The lion hath roared, who will not fear? The Lord Jehovah hath spoken, who can but prophecy? Publish ye in the palaces of Ashdod and in the palaces in the land of Egypt. So what he's saying here is, the, this is the Lord speaking to Amos. He's saying, look, you tell people this, Amos. I am speaking to you, and you are going to go out and publish this. Now, he's speaking of the particular regions of Amos' day, but the, the fact that this is the communication methodology holds true. We have the writings of the Word of God that came spiritually to the prophets. So divinely communicated visions are basically the chief way that this stuff gets communicated to us. Look what Numbers 12, 6 says. If there be a prophet among you, I, Jehovah, will make myself known to him in a vision. I will speak with him, which is literally in him, in a dream. So God goes to his chosen, the prophets, and he speaks within them spiritually to their spirit and imbues this prophet with this knowledge that he's compelled to publish. But anyway, there's a whole series of these visions. The first part of the book has got eight of them, and there's only short pauses between these. So we get this connected future of the nation Israel from 519 B.C., when this prophecy was given, all the way to the end of the Messianic kingdom. So we get this, or excuse me, the establishment of the Messianic kingdom. Anyway, there is some discussion about what the nature of that kingdom is going to be like on this earth. But that's a long time because we don't know when the kingdom's going to start. We don't know when Christ is coming back and he's going to set up his thousand-year kingdom. So the general sequence here for each one of these visions is the vision's given. Then there's a question, like there's this vision with a symbol, and what do these symbols mean? And, and then the prophet has a question, and then the question is answered with the interpretation. Moving on to the second verse, verse 8, the text says, I saw in the night, and behold, a man riding upon a red horse. And he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom. And behind him there were horses, red, sorrel, and white. Now, Zechariah sees some man who's standing among some myrtle trees. It's pretty simple. And, but he's located in some deep place, a deep hollow place, if you will. He's not on level ground. And there's three more horses. One of them also is red. The other one is a mixed color. This sorrel means a mixed color. Some think it's reddish brown, but, but they, everybody agrees it's a mixed color of some sort. And the other one is white. We don't know the identity of the man from this verse, but we do from verse 11. It's the angel of Jehovah. Malach. Yehoah, Malach Yehoah, and that is the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus in a pre-incarnate appearance on this earth. He's made a number of these pre-incarnate appearances where he's referred to as the angel of the Lord, and he's described, or God, if you will, is described in this book 52 times as the angel of host or Jehovah of host. It refers to being the supreme God of the universe. And in the spiritual realm, there are millions and millions and millions of created celestial beings and the redeemed that have left these bodies at death and gone to heaven. He, Jehovah, Yahweh, 
or so, Adonai, Hashem, El Elyon. There's a many, many names in the Bible for the God, the Father, who's over each one of these created beings, the host, if you will. The Jews, it's interesting, who don't want to believe in Jesus, although plenty of them do, but most of them in national Israel, if you will, doesn't believe in Jesus. They will even violate their own grammatical rules in Hebrew to deny that this is the angel of Jehovah. <laughs> Uh, it, it's interesting, you know, to, to see how they violate their own grammatical rules. The myrtles symbolize Israel. And it's really significant because uh, the word there is Hadassah, and it's a real popular female name in Hebrew. It was given to Queen Esther. That was her name before her name was Esther. And it's given to Jewish girls now because it's such a pretty name and it symbolizes this beauty and it's first cited in Esther 2.7. The text there reads, and he, Mordecai, brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, as his daughter, for she had neither father nor mother and the maiden was fair and beautiful. That's the portion of this that we need to remember, fair and beautiful. It comes from the Hebrew word hadas, and it's this myrtle tree from the Myrtaceae family, and it has got a pleasant fragrance. And the righteous people in the Bible are called myrtles. It's likened to a good tree with a pleasant smell. So Queen Esther, who was called Hadassah, was a Jew who easily lived within the Gentiles during the Persian Empire. She rose to a position of prominence. She became the queen, and she did with confidence, humility, modesty. She was eased into this, and she was respected. She wasn't a tyrant. She wasn't a tyrant. She wasn't trying to exert dominance, but she was very, very confident in what she was going to do. Contrary to this, we see cedars, like the cedars of Lebanon, if you will, that are viewed symbolically as the proud Gentile nations. But the lowly, fragrant myrtle tree is viewed as the nation Israel. It is a symbol of the nation Israel that you see in the Old Testament. The shady valley, if you will, is a low spot referring to the Gentile world. God identifies himself with those that are low and contrite. He does not identify himself with those that are proud and have a boosted up spirit the prideful are far from God. Look what Isaiah 57, 15 says. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite. So the low place in God's mind now, is not the humble, it's the proud. God does it exactly opposite to what we do here. The high and the mighty and, and the proud are low in God's esteem. And the low and the humble in God's esteem are high. So he looks on things differently than our world does. For a time, for a time on earth, this Gentile dominion over the Jews during that 70 years, this prophecy is telling us that God still loves them and he's not going to forsake them. And we see that specifically given in the book of Leviticus and the book of Jeremiah. Christ is on this red horse and these three other horses each have riders. They represent 
the angels that God is going to use in his dealings with human government. God uses angels to communicate and to do work for him. They are the worker bees, if you will. They are the communicators. They are the people that do what God wants to get done. They're like divine agencies, if you will, that represent God's missions. The red horse is significant of judgment, blood, and vengeance. And I put a few verses down in your notes there where you can see that reference. Um, it's important to note that in Isaiah 63, 1a, Christ the Messiah is viewed as going forth from Basra with his garments dyed red. And for those of you who are with me when we did the revelation or have been listening on the radio, you can see that, that it represents Christ in the first stage of the campaign of Armageddon, freeing the Jews from Basra and then going to Jerusalem. At, this is at the second coming, the battle of Armageddon, with his vesture dyed red in blood treading out his anger on the nations and trampling them in his fury. It's the same thing here. It's a description, the same thing here with these red horses. They're going to execute this swift judgment on all of Israel's oppressors. The white horse is always a symbol of victory and purity. And the mixed horse, the sorel, is a combination of judgment, but with mercy. Because the Lord judges this earth and its sin, but he does it with mercy. And we see this at the end of the Great Tribulation in the 75-day period. There will be a judgment that God, in Christ, judges the Gentiles for the way they treated the Jews during the Great Tribulation. He does it with mercy. And he's fair, but he's firm. He's very, very firm. Now let's look at how the Bible explains the vision. Zechariah 1, verses 9 to 11. Then said I, O my Lord, what are these? And the angel that talked with me said unto me, I will show thee what these are. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are they whom Jehovah hath sent to walk to and fro through the earth. And they answered the angel of Jehovah that stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro through the earth, and behold, all the earth sitteth still and is at ease. This is one of these spots in the Bible where it's really helpful to see the differences in the Hebrew and how it gets translated into English. Because this is a new speaker now. This is a new speaker. This is not the Malach. Yahuwah, this is the Malach Hadober B, Hadober B. It's an entirely different angel that's speaking. The angel that talked with me, or literally it says, in me, be in me, is not the same as the angel of Jehovah. This is a different angel. Uh, Zechariah doesn't address him as my Lord Adonai, which is the exclusive name of God, Adonai, the, the Hebrew word Adon just means Lord, master, you know, somebody that owns something, uh, an overseer. But Adonai is my Lord and is the personal name of Christ, the personal name of God, the Father, if you will. Uh, this is a messenger that is bringing this covenant, this vision. Uh, we call this an attendant angel. He's bringing the vision, and we see the same thing in Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. I'm going to read that to you, just that very, very first verse of the book in Revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things that must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto the servant John. This is how God communicates. He has angels do the communication, and in this case, the angel is in the vision speaking directly to Zechariah. 
the message starts with the identification of these horses, where he says, these are they whom Jehovah hath sent to walk to and fro on the earth. Now, the words to and fro are a Hebrew idiomatic phrase that refers to walking about and asserting dominance. That's what it means in Hebrew. Uh, like if I just bought a new piece of property and I was going to walk to and fro on it in biblical speak, I would be um, asserting my ownership of this, my dominance, my authority, my sovereignty, if you will. We see this in Abraham, Genesis 13, 17, to, where he was told to walk to and fro about the property in Canaan that was going to be his. And the king of Tyre, in his pride, from Ezekiel 28, 14. But the text moves on to say that all the earth sitteth still and is at rest. That's a description of the Gentile world after they've conquered the Jews being complacent while the Jews are subjugated and being persecuted. Um, Israel was in a very mournful condition, whereas all the nations around them just uh, were happy and enjoying status, you know. They didn't even think about it. The nations had scattered God's people, and they'd taken possession of the land, and they were leisurely enjoying the status that they had. They didn't care about the Jews. That was all done. That was over. The Jews were subjugated and living amongst them in the diaspora, but the Gentiles were at ease, leisurely enjoying those activities. The only way to change a status like that is through civil unrest, like a revolution, or God intervening and or both. And in this case, it's God intervening. And this book is going to show us all of God's intervention throughout time, including those that are yet future to us on the Great Tribulation, before he sets up his messianic kingdom. So the prophet asks, how long is this going to go on? I mean, how, how long are you going to keep doing this? The 12th verse says, Then the angel of Jehovah answered and said, O Jehovah of hosts, how long will thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah, against which thou hast hast indignation these threescore and ten years? So the angel of Jehovah is answering Zechariah, and he's asking God at the same time. So Zechariah is here, like he's standing with the messenger, if you will. This is all spiritual and all a vision. And he's going, hey, how long is this going to go on? How long is this going to go on? We've been disciplined for 70 years. He told us through the prophet Jeremiah that this captivity was going to last 70 years. And remember now, this is 519 B.C., the captivity started in 586 B.C., so it's getting close. It's getting close to finishing. And they're asking, is it not done now? Isn't it over yet? I mean, how long do we have to do this? A remnant was going to go back and had gone back. The temple was going to be rebuilt. It would be completed just three years later in 516 B.C., but we have to understand that this 70 years had what we like to think of as a flexible ending because there were three Babylonian invasions, 605 B.C., 597 B.C., and then the big one, 586 B.C. So some want to measure the termination of the captivity as the rebuilding of the city, but more, I think, accurately, it's the rebuilding of the temple because the temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 B.C. And Zerubbabel and his crew were rebuilding it, and they had it open for services in 516 B.C. That was exactly 70 years. So the poor condition of things moves this angel of Jehovah to intercede on their behalf. 
In other words, God is going to change this. He waits for the crying out of the Jews, though. It's the same thing he's going to do at the end of the Great Tribulation. He's going to wait for the crying out of the Jews to confess his name. That we brought this on ourselves because we didn't believe you. And that's when the Great Tribulation is going to end. Now watch, watch here in this next set of verses how God uses this angel to communicate to a man. And Jehovah answered the angel and talked with me with good words, even comfortable words. So the angel that talked with me said unto me, Cry thou, saying, Thus saith Jehovah of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. And I am very sore, displeased with the nations that are at ease. But I was but a little displeased, and they helped forward the affliction. So Jehovah God answers what this vision means. And the angel of Jehovah, who in ancient times led his people out of Egypt through the promised land, appeared to them in a number of different ways that we call the Shekinah glory, which is a physical manifestation of God in time and space. He's now the advocate and the intercessor for them to end the Babylonian captivity, start rebuilding the city, and rebuild the temple. He begins to provide what the Hebrews call Devarim Tovim and Devarim Nukarim. Therefore, thus saith Jehovah, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it, saith Jehovah of hosts, and a line shall be stretched forth over Jerusalem. Cry yet again, saying, Thus saith Jehovah of hosts, My cities shall yet overflow with prosperity, and Jehovah shall yet comfort Zion and shall yet choose Jerusalem. So God is promising here in these closing verses of this vision four specific visible promises that are going to be restored in their sight, things they can see to signify the mercy that he has towards them. One, my house shall be built in it, saith Jehovah of hosts. That's a visible sign of his pledge to this people. And the temple was rebuilt. And the temple was rebuilt. And a line <clears throat> shall be stretched forth over Jerusalem. This is a building term. To mark off the space and to restore its condition on the plan that is going to be arranged here. And not only shall his house be rebuilt in Jerusalem, be restored on a grander scale, but all the land is going to feel blessed. And they're going to feel the effects of this restoration and his relationship that will be restored between God and the Jews, his chosen people. And finally, it's going to come the last of this these good words, if you will, these good words, Davarim Tovim, and Jehovah shall yet comfort Zion. So against all the way it looked at that time, God is saying, I'm going to comfort you. I'm going to comfort you. See, he wants us and those Jews to trust him, not what we see. We look out there and see chaos. We see a government that appears to be out of control. We see scandals. We see huge amounts of abortion. We see uh, the rise of the sexual deviance and the militancy in those areas. We see the crazy religious zealots from Islam and others that are out killing people. We think, man, is God in control? And here's what he's saying to these Jews. I have mercy and I've yet chosen you. I am in control. I am in control. And I'm going to demonstrate what I'm doing so the whole world can see it. And when that city was rebuilt, after that captivity and that temple was rebuilt, everybody looked and said, how did that happen? <laughs> how did that happen? And there will be another temple rebuilt. There will be another one before the Great Tribulation starts. And people are going to wonder, how did that happen?
How did that happen? Look what Isaiah 14.1 says. For Jehovah will have compassion on Jacob and yet choose Israel and set them in their own land. And the stranger shall be joined with them and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. Cry yet again, saying, Thus saith Jehovah of hosts, My cities. He's proclaiming Jerusalem and Judah as his property. No matter what happens over there, it belongs to him. And again, the hard part for us to see is that we see the visible. He is spirit. He is working to change the way the physical is so that we can see what he's doing. But he's in control. He's in control. No prosperity shall yet be spread abroad. And the idea there is like Proverbs 5.16, this gushing forth like a fountain. What's gonna, what did happen back then and what is it, nothing compared to what's going to happen yet in the future. Here's Israel back in the land. Their language, a dead language, has been restored. It's like a country just pops up someplace and they start speaking Latin. What? I mean, nobody ever thought that would happen. This guy named Eliezer ben Yehuda immigrated to Israel in the late 1800s and says, okay, we're going to start speaking Hebrew. And they all looked at him like, are you nuts? What do you mean speak Hebrew? The only people that even know anything about Hebrew are the rabbis, and they were violently opposed to it. They thought that this was a sacred language. You can't uh, speak this. What well, used to be spoken before the captivity it was spoken. Everybody spoke Hebrew. The, the Hebrew Bible, our Old Testament, written in Hebrew, was that was just the normal language back then. It wasn't anything unusual. And it's back. It's back. He was able to prevail through a lot of fighting. I mean, he had a tough time. He did it. Can you imagine trying to get a whole country to speak one language? I mean, we're having a tough time here getting English. Yeah. <laughs> but we started with English. They went back in the land in May of 48 and didn't have a language. It, I mean, it's phenomenal. It is absolutely phenomenal to see how God works through this Bible. And he does everything that he says. Everything that he says. So I just want to close with these seven Things, these seven aspects of God's attitude towards them in this prophecy he says, one, I am jealous. And he says, I am sore displeased with the Gentiles. And he will restore Jerusalem to fulfill his program. He will do what he says he's going to do. The temple will be rebuilt. And this, again, this line of construction over the city is a, or this line of, um, <coughs> the line, if you will, is a, uh, a construction tool used to measure off things in a specific way. It's a construction terminology. It's to signify the building that's going to take place in the city. And he says, my city will be prosperous. And again, you can't miss that identification, that personal identification. My city. Eerie. Eerie. It's interesting. The way the Hebrews make possession is they just add a vowel to the end of something. So if I said uh, the word for wife is Isha, well, if I would say to Joan, she's my wife, I would say Ishti. Just add an E to the end of it. And that's what he's doing here. Eerie. Ear is the Hebrew word for city. And it's eerie. Eerie. My city belongs to me, and Jerusalem will yet be chosen, and Zion, which is the nation Israel, will yet be comforted. Shall we pray? In Israel will yet be comforted. Shall we pray? In Israel will yet be comforted. Shall we pray? In Israel. We hope you have been blessed by this message today on a contemporarily relevant Bible topic. Dr. Woodhead has been teaching the Bible for 25 years. He is a pastor, an author, and conference speaker on various biblical subjects. 
Dr. Woodhead is the Dean of the Jewish Studies School at Schofield Seminary. His seminary teaching includes the Old Testament and Biblical Hebrew. He has attended Hebrew University in Jerusalem and a Hebrew College in Massachusetts. Please write us at Post Office Box 48, Hart, Michigan, 49420. Again, that's Post Office Box 48, Hart, Michigan, 49420. Or call us at 877 706 2479. That's 877 706 2479. Once again, 877 706 2479. Let us know if you have any questions about today's broadcast. We look forward to providing you with continuing Bible messages each week on this station. God bless you.